Welcome to episode 10 of Ask the Grounding Experts, where our experts from ENS Grounding Solutions answer your engineering questions about the world of grounding and earthing. Today, our man of mystery, Mr. David Stocken, begins another two part series, this time answering the question What is resistance to ground measurement? Take it away, David. All right. Welcome, guys. This is the uh, first part of our resistance to ground measurement videos. We'll have another part next week for you. Today, we're going to talk about the traditional three-point fall of potential method and how we can use that for measuring the resistance to ground. And if you recall, this is part of our three of our three tests. This is our uh, three-point test, and it's designed to measure a piece of metal in contact with the earth, right? So the key thing to understand on the uh, fall of potential method is we need to have a remote earth reference point, right? So in almost every test we do, we have a signal and we have a return. And in this case, we need to place a return path and that return path needs to be an electrode that we're gonna install in the ground. And we want that to be what we call remote earth, right? So what is remote Earth? Well, there's a couple ways to think of it. Most people think of it as the other side of the planet, right? Or some people think of it as the center of the Earth, right? Um, well, stretching a wire from your grounding system you want to test to the other side of the planet is uh, something less than convenient, right? It's pretty hard to get to the other side of the planet with a wire, right? So what we say is we say that's uh, 10 times our sphere of influence is good enough. Right, so you take the size of your grounding system, and you take the diag maximum diagonal length, and in the case uh, uh, what we've been using commonly in these videos is a 100 foot by 100 foot uh, substation grounding grid, right? Which diagonal distance is going to be about 141 feet, so we can say 150 feet. So we want to say that one sphere of influence is 150 feet. So we want to be 10 times that distance away from it. So we would go out 1,500 feet away from the substation and we would drive a return path, a series of pins in the ground. Sometimes it's a small pin, sometimes it's a series of pins. And we would install that, that would be our remote earth reference point. We would stretch a wire back to our meter. Now, if you recall in our four point test, we had, uh, two pins for injecting current, and two pins for measuring voltage. Well, in our three-point test, what we do is we tie two of the pins together. So at our electrode under test, in this case, a substation, we're going to inject current and have our voltage reference point at our substation. We're going to inject it right into our substation's grounding grid and have our voltage reference tied to that same substation grid. And then out at our remote earth, we're going to tie our other current probe all the way out to the outside. So we're injecting current into our substation ground grid. And then at remote earth, 1,500 feet away, we're going to catch that current. And then we're going to take our last voltage probe. And we're going to measure it at various points along that linear axis there in order to calculate out what our ultimate resistance to ground of our system is, right? So what we do is we take that extra voltage probe, that third probe, uh, we've locked in our, we can call them current probe one and current probe two and voltage probe one, and then we have voltage probe two, right? So current probe one and voltage probe one are tied to our grounding system under test. Current probe two is tied to our remote ground source. So what we're going to do is we're going to move voltage probe two up and down that uh, down that axis, and we're going to move it at one sphere of influence intervals. So we're going to go out at to 150 feet, and we're going to take a measurement, and then we're going to go out to 300 feet and take a measurement. We're going to go 
out to 450 feet and take a measurement, et cetera, et cetera, till we get all the way out to nine sphere of influences and take a measurement of it. And what this is going to do, it's going to allow us to plot a curve. So if on our x-axis we have our resistance that we measured, and on our y-axis we have our distance away and spheres of influence away from our uh, uh, electrode under test, we're going to see a 2 pi curve, this nice curve. It comes down, flattens out, and then it falls again down to near zero. And we want to see this curve, and that tells us we have a valid test is when we see that curve. And the standard says it's 62 percent, right around the 60 or the number uh, six spheres of influence, that that should be our resistance to ground in reference to remote Earth, right? The uh, uh, that distance by seeing that curve tells us that we have injected 100 percent of the current into our ground grid, that 100% of it was caught back by our C2 probe, and that we had enough distance and spheres of influence to generate that nice flat. And that's where the name fall of potential comes in. You see a flat spot on the curve, then it falls off. And that's where uh, you get the term fall of potential. It's that point where we start to fall off, and there's some calculation. There's, again, like all tests, there's quite a bit of detail into this uh, uh, information. When you get into IEEE Standard 81, which governs this test, you'll see that there's a lot of details about the type of soil you're in, and sometimes it's not always 62%. It can move depending on the type of soil. There's a lot of details, so you really do need to understand how this test works uh, and how you want to do it effectively and efficiently. When you get into impedance to ground or impedance to earth measurement, it gets even more complicated. Um, we don't have time to go over those kinds of details in videos such as this right now. Um, uh, perhaps in a future video, you never know. But for now, that should give you a pretty good idea is, uh, of how this test ultimately works. Now, um, one thing that the reason we take all those measurements is to see if we get a valid curve or an invalid curve. An invalid curve is one where at our, we see an immediate fall to near zero and it stays flat across the entire length of our plot. That tells us that we did not isolate our current. We're not injecting 100% of the test current through our ground grid. It's going up and out through something else. So for example, say our uh, substation has overhead ground wires coming in, static lines coming in from the incoming power lines, right? Some of that current, we're injecting that current into our ground grid. Instead of going down into the earth, it's going up the overhead power lines and across the transmission lines. And we're in fact not testing a 100 by 100 grid. We're testing a 100 by 100 grid plus all of the towers associated with it and the substation they land on on the other other sides we're testing a massive grounding system and therefore we're not outside of our sphere our 10 times our sphere of influence for remote earth uh, and we get an invalid curve that's why engineers want to see all of the plot points we don't want you to just go out and measure at six sixty percent and walk away because we don't know whether you have a valid test or an invalid test unless we take those 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent measurements are also provided in the test. Right? Now this resistance to ground test, once you have it, it can be useful for validating the computer models to make sure that the math in the computer was done properly and that you know you have good step and touch voltages over time. Um, and it can check to see if there's been deterioration of your grounding system over time. So when you first installed the grounding grid, it had a resistance to ground of 5 ohms, and over time it's increased to 10 ohms. I can tell you that the um, uh, ground rods and grounding system is slowly corroding and beginning to fail, right? And this is very bad. The problem is, is this test is often not very useful for us. We need a lot of dirt, right? We need a lot of green space. So in a substation that's in an urban environment, this is not the test for you. I mean, there's no way you're going to stretch a wire 1,500 feet. You've got too many other buried metal objects in between, right? So a buried pipeline in the way or a road or 
whatever it is can totally impact the, the way that current is going to propagate back to the substation, your test will be compromised, right? So you can only use this in very specific um, uh, areas and only usually only when you're first in construction because once that substation is turned on, it's highly likely they're going to turn it off again for you to do this test. It's highly unlikely you're going to unbond all of the various bits of uh, wires that are coming in, all of the telco lines and water pipes and everything else that may be feeding that substation that could compromise your test, right? So uh, usually you do this test only in greenfield environments and only as a validation uh, during original construction and it's almost never done afterwards. Uh, what we tend to do is we rely on uh, computer models and dedicated test wells to check individual ground rods that are inside of that substation in order to see if those are corroding and that will tell if one of them is corroding probably the rest of them are corroding as well and in fact that's what we're going to talk about in part two is we're going to discuss how we can use an induced frequency or clamp on ground resistance meter to measure the resistance to ground of various electrodes and help us in a real world environment determine what our grounding system is like and whether it's having problems over time or not. And so if you join us next week, uh, we'll have another video and discuss that in our part two of uh, resistance to ground measurements. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for watching. If you found this episode helpful, please give us a quick like down below and subscribe to stay up to date on future educational videos we will be publishing. And feel free to post questions or comments below as well. We might even feature your questions in future videos. If you want to learn more about the amazing world of electrical engineering and grounding, be sure to check out our certified online courses at the links in the description below to kickstart your career. We'll see you next time.